The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren. And I have nothing to say. No, actually, um, <laughs> on the other side of the country, we've got the rational one, the one everyone likes, the nice guy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave, Dave Martino, who, who I'm apparently super mean to. You're mean. I'm mean. You're a meanie. I'm a <laughs> brat. I'm, no, I'm no, just, no. yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, you know, they're punishing me now. They keep telling me that I'm <laughs> an awful human being. And uh, but no threats, so I can keep on doing. <laughs> it's when they start to threaten me, I have to worry. You know, you know. Maybe I'll take up van life. Yeah, there you go. I thought we were more like Albert Abbott and Costello. Well, what? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you must be the Abbott one, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> See, I'm being mean again. I, have, I, I haven't figured out which one we are. No, I can't. You know, I can't. This goes back and forth. Yeah. Well, somebody's got to do it. Someone's got to keep you in your place. That's right. Yeah. Um, so speaking of places <laughs> to keep you in, um, we've, yeah, we've, we've got a man um, that has uh, got a new book coming out. It's it's exciting. It's sort of a different style from what I understand. So uh, we've got the author here, and the book, of course, we're co- talking about well if i can speak is danny a growing up gay and creative and of course the author is danny crowley thank you for being here thank you thank you very much this book is about you then right it covers my from from birth to graduation from high school um and it's 50 draw full color drawings showing my evolution growing up as a gay and creative person. So I guess you're trying to tell us you're gay. <laughs> and creative. <laughs> and creative. I mean, you, you, you couldn't come out any louder. I mean. yeah, well, no, I, you know, I'm 61. I came out a long time ago. Yeah. And, and actually, it wasn't loud at all. It was very church mouse-like. It was step by step by step. But the steps added up. Well, yeah, I guess they'd have to. Uh, but uh, so what is it about growing up gay for you we're about the same age i'm 60 or 61 now i haven't written a book about myself <laughs> being gay right or already that stuff i just was so i just I, i'm wondering what is it that uh gave you the uh i don't know push or thought to go i'm gonna write this down I, in so much speaking i know it's a, a picture book but well yeah but it it started because of the uh, lockdown um, going into quarantine. And, you know, I bet we're going to start seeing all sorts of quarantine inspired art. Um, artists being locked away in their studios. And what did they do with the time that they were given? You know, it was kind of a boon for creative people who, uh, had dreamed of be- being immersed in a project. And I got that time and I did it. And at the time I had several other books that I was working on. Um, and they were gay themed, but they weren't about me. I'm, I'm, I'm not usually the focus of my work. But as the uh, quarantine started to move on, I started to wonder, well, what if this is the only book I ever get to do? You know, what if I get sick and die? And what if, you know, I can't do anything else? What is the one thing I'd like to leave behind? And the answer came back that I wanted to leave behind help to kids who were like me when I was growing up. When I was when I was different and growing up, there was no help for me. There was no positive gay role models on television. You know, um, I read a, you know, it's covered in the book, but I, I, I found one of my parents' books deals with homosexuality when I'm 11 and I read it. And it said that homosexuals will never be loved, will never have a home and are are doomed to a life of promiscuous sex in public bathrooms. You know, I was a good Catholic boy. That wasn't the future I wanted. So when I decided to pour my my childhood life into something that would be of use to the people who came behind me, um, I took it very seriously. And I, I wrote it, and then I started drawing it, and that's when I noticed it was two different books. 
And I focused on the drawn book and I simplified it as much as possible so that people like yourself who are around my age can look at it and each page hopefully will bring up a memory of your own, some way that you connect with it yourself. Because it, ultimately the book is not about me, it's about all of us. We all have these moments and yours are slightly different, but they're basically the same thing. Times when it's we're, we're learning the invisible boundaries between us and the people we're supposed to be. Well, you, you know, um, wasn't Charles Nelson Riley a good positive role model? <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> but would would a bank want to give him a loan or would they see him as a fool? Yeah. You know, Snagglepuss was also a great gay, <laughs> gay <laughs> star, but he's not going to be taken seriously in the boardroom either. Yeah. You know, to be taken seriously as a man and as an equal, as a human, that took some time and it's still taking some time. Yeah. I want to yeah. be part of the solution. So um, it, it's interesting. What what kind of got you into? Why did you decide the picture route rather than the uh, written route? Well, because the written route, which is the way I started, was full of anger <laughs> and tears and names and accusations, and that that makes it all a different project. If my goal is to help, I'm not doing it that way. All I'm doing is hurting the people that hurt me and, and naming the names and, and, and asking for sympathy. And that's not what I'm doing. When I'm, you know, the book that I made is not about the reactions to the moments. It's about the child's freedom before the reaction. There's only one, one case in here in the book where I'm like 12, 11, and I have kind of long hair. And I kept being told that summer that I looked like Danny Bonaducci. You know, so that gives you a reference. I look like Danny Partridge. Um, I was in a store looking at stuff, and I looked at some perfume bottles, and the sales lady just stood there and glared at me. And then she leans in and says, I'll be right with you, little girl, trying to shame me because I had long hair, and I was looking at perfume bottles. But instead, I just looked at her and smiled and blinked and stayed for a couple more minutes and then left. I wasn't going to tell her that she was wrong. I wasn't going to give her that moment. But I found out adults can be cruel, too, just for the fun of it. Well, that's true. Um, now, are you a who are you aiming this book for? Is this for kids or for adults, or is it for everyone? Is that well, it's, it's for everyone, and therefore there are some things in it in my development which I didn't cover. You know, it has no sex. There is oh. there is no Danny learns to masturbate moment in there. That that's not in there. That, that's in my friends only. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. Wow. Uh, but yeah, I mean it, it. I I kept it so that it could be seen by anybody. Different people will have different reactions. Um, since the book came out, I've heard from mothers whose kids loved it. I've heard from, you know, people older than me who loved it and connected to it, too. So, you know, the, I think it's kind of interesting that the book is hard to fit into a peg, into a square, just like I am. You know, it's, it's this, the whole thing. It, none of it fits into anything, but it is what it is. Hmm. Well, you could have an adult edition. <laughs> you know, well, I'm that's not, not who I am. Well, just suggesting that Thank maybe you. you know that could be a <laughs> you know a special online right. you know 19.99 a month, right? Uh, yeah, adult only. You know, that's <laughs> um, well, that's that's cool. So now, how did you come up with the pictures? Now, this I know this is going to this is a pretty broad question. Um, well, yeah, it, you know, limiting it too. I mean, I, I had a wealth of information and I put up, um, a bunch of pieces of paper on the wall, big, pa you know, filled the wall with big sheets of paper and wrote different ears on them and tried to remember the stories. And then I would write down basically when I think it happened. And then on each page, I did a quick little sketch of what Danny would look like and the kind of things he was wearing on that year. Um, and that helped me visualize it. And then it, it became about which stories would translate to a single image. 
and a single line of copy. Um, some stories just, they're just too complicated. Um, I, and I couldn't simplify them or stories that were kind of similar. Um, I wanted the whole thing to cover a bunch of different aspects of being either gay or creative that came out. Um, and to see that, you know, when you see one character going through all of these experiences, um, that was an interesting thing for me to do as an illustrator, to take one character and on each page, it's a little bit older going through a different stage of life. Um, and I think it worked. When you flip through the book, you, it takes a while before you even realize the kid's growing up. So, so when you dis display one of the pictures, when, when, if I was to look at any one picture, mm -hmm. what I'm getting is your point of view about that situation that happened to you at that time. Is that correct? Well, uh, except for you're not seeing it from my perspective. You're seeing me in the picture. So you're part of of yeah. what it is. It's not from your perspective. So it's just from a general onlook of you in a situation. Right. right. So like there's one scene I fat we, we had, a, we had a barn where we grew up and I was the youngest of five and we found exploring in the barn one day, a huge box filled with old magazines and like I was nine and the magazines were Playboy, you know, early episodes of Playboy. Right. Right. And I remember all of us little boys standing around ripping these magazines open, all the kids from the neighborhood. And I said out loud, look at those shoes. <laughs> Everybody looked at me like I, <laughs> I was crazy, <laughs> but they were amazing mules with big feathers on them. I'd never seen that before. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so you know, it's it's kind of like you know using myself as a cartoon character, but it's a little more serious than that. Some of them are funny, some of them are not quite so funny. Yeah, yeah. So so you're actually um, putting in uh, years of your own personal history in this, and you're putting this out there for mm -hmm. everyone to see. Does that sort of make you feel a little vulnerable? Um, it didn't at first. I did have that moment um, because when I made the book, I thought that I might do a GoFundMe thing with my social media friends to back me and make a few copies for them, basically. And then while I was working on it and talking about it online, I heard from a, a publisher who wanted to see it when it was finished. And they liked it and they asked if they could publish it. And I said, yes. And the next thing I know, it's now being offered in Japan and Australia. <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, it, it's gone. When, when it, it became number one on an Amazon category at one point, and I started to think, oh, my God, what really did I do? <laughs> what did I do? Um, but I got over it pretty quickly, you know, because – I, like I said, I, I'm on a mission. This isn't about me. It's about the kids I'm trying to help. It's about the parents and the grown-ups I'm trying to help and heal. You know, we weren't monsters. We weren't wrong. The system was wrong. The people who were telling us to be people we aren't were wrong. You know, what, 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 what made us test our boundaries was our freedom that we thought we had. And I say, take that freedom back. Yeah. I, I you know... Let's burn our bras. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I still need mine, unfortunately. But you, you youngsters, go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't wear one. Damn it! No. Um, uh, but um, okay. So, where did you get the courage to draw so well, or or to actually put drawings in a book to publish it? Like, have you got drawing experience? Like, where where does that come oh, from? Yeah, um, I've been self-employed as an artist for decades and um, my work sells on um, by Dan Crowley studio. Um, I used to do the wholesale buyers and market of American crafts um, and sold my sculptures and paintings. I work in oil on canvas, um, all of it kind of cartooned imagery. Um, my sculptures, I make a lot of uh, finger puppets are one of the things I'm known for. Not many people can make that claim. Um, my finger puppets are sold in galleries around the world. 
Um, they're made out of polymer clay, and their eyes glow in the dark. Um, in the past, you know, 15 years, 20 years or so, I started doing portraiture of the, with those, and uh, so I've been doing a lot of portraiture. Um, I have an Etsy shop now, um, and I'm on Facebook, Dan Crowley Studio, and I hear from people who, like, will commission, like, somebody a puppet of someone for their birthday or a pet that's getting old they they commission a sculpture of that so little side things keep coming in when you know like you hang the art shingle up you know part of the community is the baker the the candlestick maker and the artist (laughs) and you need the artist you know the artist helps you celebrate the members of your own life so you know i've been doing that kind of thing um, and also having little moments of, you know, when I was younger, I was on stage. I was doing um, uh, Players Workshop of Second City um, here and with uh, Robert Smigel was in my class, Doug Dale, um, you know, Will Klinger, who's here in Chicago doing Wild Travels. Uh, I knew a lot of people when we were all getting started, um, and they all stayed with that. I'm very proud of them. Um, I've done all kinds of things. Uh and I really enjoyed it. I've, I had a cartoon strip in Chicago here for a little over three years called Uncle Dan, which also was about gay issues. Um, I wanted it to be a <laughs> I wanted it to be a cartoon strip that wasn't about sex. Um, so much of the gay cartoon world is is about sex, and I I just wanted to show that there's more to us than that. So for me, it was it was more like a social commentary through a gay perspective, which in a way, so is the book. Well, where did the art uh, start for you? Did, was that in high school or grade school? Or? Well, actually, um, <laughs> the very first page in the book, it says, uh, in the beginning, my parents discover that I'm an artist. And then you turn the page and there's... Uh, <laughs> The moment my parents found out I was an artist, I was in my playpen, which was pushed up against the wall, and I had reached into my pants and taken all my stuff out and was using it like finger paint on the wall. Um, my mom my mom was a painter, and so I used to watch her paint, and so I must have been mimicking what she was doing. But, you know, that's when my mom knew, okay, he's an artist. And by the time I was in kindergarten, I was working – with oil paints on canvas. We were all taught how to use basic art tools. Um, And so art was always part of our family life and it was always a language. It was always a vocabulary that I spoke. Um, I made my gifts, you know, every Christmas and that kind of stuff, you know, always made my gifts from my relatives, always made our cards. it was always part of who I am. And so it's, you know, being able to draw. And I used in the book, it's it's drawn by hand with marker, colored with colored pencil on typing paper that's then scanned. You know, it's it, I wanted it to be from my hand and not from a computer. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to do this on a computer, a computer screen and have it look slick and untouched. Um, I wanted it to be as honest as possible. It, it's pretty uh, pretty unusual in a sense to come out with something like this. It, it, was there a point to this, like when when you decided you know you're in lockdown and you're going to do this? Um, what was what was it that you wanted to accomplish for people? Well, you know, like I said, when I went through it, I thought it was just me that I was the only person, only little boy ever going through this. Um, when I was six, um, I was told that, you know, at church one day that boys who like boys are the sin that dare not speak its name. And I took that to mean that I was so broken that I couldn't even have, you know, people couldn't even know if people knew how broken I was, there'd be no fixing me. You know, like you can't even speak my name. I'm so awful. Um, it was a pretty big thing to hand to a kid, which it's meant to be. You know, it's it's scare tactics. Uh, I, I wanted to, like I said, reach out to the kids who are growing up now and just to see that, you know, it, like I said, you know, it's okay to be yourself. It's, it is okay to be yourself, and it's, you know, it's it's your life. You know, bottom line, it's your life. Claim it, you know. And uh, I certainly have, 
you know, I had a few years where, you know, um, seventh and eighth grade were very difficult years for me. Um, and then in high school, I found the performing arts department. In high school, I found the art department and I blossomed. Um, suddenly people saw that I had a language, you know, I wasn't just closed off. There were things that I could do. There were things, ways that I could express myself. And I know that my story is not an amazing story. It's just what happens to us. And I think more of us that speak up and, and say what our life is like or what it was like, I think the, it, it blows away the myths. You know, all these, you know, I, I saw a clip about how gay people are portrayed by the news anchors in Egypt. And I was horrified at the things that they said about homosexuals. And I thought, it's like, have they never met a homosexual? You know, the, the way you were talking, you would think that we crawled out of hell, you know? And I, I think it's, we're also now in what I think of as the golden age of elder gay men. <laughs> you know, we're the ones who survived. We're the ones who saw our friends not survive. We're the ones who were helped by the lesbians to be more mainstream and out and to come out of our own shell and be part of a larger community. It's, it's our time now to tell our story. And there's lots of them coming out. There's lots of them coming out. And like I said, I want to be part of the, 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 the voice that helps. I don't want to just complain about the past. I want to help for the future. So how do you choose which you've got 50 full color drawings? So um, based on your memories, how did you choose which of the 50 you were going to use? Well, there were lots that didn't get used. I'll say that um, there were lots that did not get used. Uh, I started to think of them as billboards. And how quickly could you be driving and get this message? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're looking at the page for a split second, does the story make sense right away? How much explanation does this take? Maybe this is not the venue for the story. Um, that's when, you know, like the, the other story, the written one, that's still in bits and pieces. Um, maybe that's more for that. Where did your, where do you think your creative drawing ability came from? Or do you know? Oh, well, I know. I, I come from two amazing families. Um, both New York families. My, uh, my parents grew up across the street from each other in Brooklyn and Park Slope. My dad was born in the house that he lived in in Park Slope. His father was also born in that house. His father bought the house when he came home from the Civil War. So they were there for a long time. Um, and in the family history, my grandfather's uncle was a performer on Broadway stages back in the days of Footlights. And in the summertime, when it was too hot in the theaters for the cast to be there, all the actors had to find summer work. So in the summer times, he worked at Coney Island, and he was the half man, half woman, and he went by Sylvie. So that's Sylvie Crowley. And when my grandfather told me the story, I was probably like seven. And my grandfather told me about my uncle, great uncle, who was the half man, half woman at Coney Island. I said, was he really a half man, half woman? And my grandfather put his finger up in the air like he's making a point and said, no, he was a charlatan. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great source of pride. So, yeah, you know, I come from a long line of characters. My mom's side is more artistic. Like I said, my mother was an artist. Um, and we know that there were other artists in her family going back. Her family um, was upstate New York, um, up in the Hudson River Valley, and her family had a farm, and her her great uncle was a minister or something like that. They had a church. Uh, and there's all sorts of beautiful little old family pieces that have some artwork on them, um, which had to be done by them. Um, so, yeah, I think it's from her side, the, the illustration and artwork. Uh, like I said, she she was teaching us artwork all my life. I mean, she uh, my mother was an amazing person. She um, 
she was going to spend more art time on her oil paintings when she retired from her job at the phone company. And then right before retirement, she lost her vision. Um, and so she had to learn how to paint with the vision she had. Um, she was basically blind and she had, she learned Braille. So she knew what color she was working in. Um, and she inspired a bunch of other artists. There was articles written about her. She was an amazing person. Now, when, when you create art, do you, do you see the images in your head before you translate them to uh, the page or how, how does that work for you? You know, I, I it, it is interesting because uh, when I'm sculpting, there's a kind of sculpting like, like the statue of David, when you start with a rock and you take away all the stuff that's not correct. Hmm. Right. Um, or there's a type of sculpting I do, which is from the inside out. So I'm adding pieces all the way through until it's finished. So I start with an armature and then build up. And I pretty much do the same thing with my, my illustration work, my, my two dimensional work. Um, I don't like to have too secure a point that I want to get at the end. I want to leave it open um, so that the emotion of the work can, can be true. And, and it's, it's its own experience. I like to think of it as, you know, brushing the sand off hieroglyphics. You know, you're just kind of giving your, your energy to your piece until it's finished and you see what it is. Um, and I love that. I, you know, sometimes, especially doing sculpting these, these characters in polymer clay that I do, I, I, I did a lot of them for Tiffany and company over the years for their window displays and Hermes and Sears World Headquarters. Uh, when you're sculpting a character, it's one thing, but when I put the final black dots in the eyes and it looks back at me, that's always a moment for me. There's always a, like a, you know, it, boom, it begins. <laughs> not, not too Beastmaster like, but, but, you know, something is different for me when it looks back at me and I feel it, you know, that's also with the focus of the eyes. Um, I've had people say to me, well, your work really looks like it's looking back at you. And it's like, well, it's because I'm not finished until it's looking back at me and, you know, moving the dots around. So it's kind of like a discovery. Truly, truly. You know, um, I was never really that interested in like being an architect. Um, it, you know, I like the idea of, of creating things, but when you get down to find those kind of fine point things, like, you know, really thinking of something and then going for that exact thing, um, that to me is too limiting. I, I want the journey to bring something. Now, so you've had some, uh, some of your paintings showcased at the Chicago Public Library, and you mm -hmm. seem to have a fixation with frogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yes. Uh, when I was small, um, I, geez, I was uh, fifth grade, sixth grade. I started studying the Walt Disney, early days of the Walt Disney Studio. Um, I was fascinated. I started going to flea markets and, and buying old Disney things cheaply back then. That was before anybody wanted them. I could get old Disney toys for nickels um, that later on went into museums, you know. I like frogs. My mom liked frogs. We had frogs around our house. And I decided that my Mickey Mouse was going to be a frog character. And so I came up with my character, which is Fargo Frog. And Fargo is still part of my life. Um, I, From the very beginning, I drew him as different people from history and pop history. Um, and then years later, I did the series of paintings based on those those drawings from childhood. Um, and expanded the line, and then people started asking for portraits of themselves or friends as frogs, and then it became something that I was known as, and I just kind of fell into it. But I do like frogs, and I like that they have bellies and that they're nonviolent. I can connect to that. Well, that's half of Dave, but... <laughs> <laughs> but which half? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to let you guess. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, um, so Fargo, who is Fargo for you? Like, I, I ask this not because I'm weird. Well, I am weird, but I ask this <laughs> because so many of the creatives I talk to, writers and, and everything, they seem to have a personal connection with the creations. Like, it's almost like family or friends or children, per se. <laughs> uh, what would your description of something like Fargo be? I think that's very, that's very good. Uh, you know, Fargo was uh 
my entry into character design, um, taking it seriously, going from just doing doodles to doing a doodle repeatedly and then perfecting the way that looks and thinking about what you would do with it, I wanted to take Fargo and use him in cartoons like Mickey Mouse. Um, and also I, I saw him as a very happy, well-adjusted <laughs> You know, character, I, I saw him as a character filled with positive messages. Um, it, most kids, most little boys, when they're drawing, they draw little airplanes with bullets coming out of them and stuff like that. I was always drawing little smiley faces and little eyes looking back at you. And basically, that's what Fargo was, a little happy, happy character. And uh, seeing him... One one of the first times I drew him, I drew him as Marie Antoinette. And I don't know why that was. I don't know how I went from basic frog to what would this frog look like as Marie Antoinette. But I did that, and then Henry VIII, and then Marilyn Monroe. Um, and that's how it started. Um, it became kind of like an image for myself. In high school, I used Fargo in uh, choir concert programs. Um, I used Fargo. I did cartoons for my high school paper. Um, I used Fargo in some of those. There was one where there was a biology book open and a drawing of a frog with its guts opened up and all the points being pointed out, the, the illustration and all these frogs sitting around crying <laughs> into their handkerchiefs um, looking at the book. Uh, so, yeah, he's, he became kind of a, an image for myself. As, as probably most cartoon characters are for the creators, like Charlie Brown was for his creator. Yeah. Like Fargo does drag. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, you know. Marilyn right, Monroe. right. Far, Fargo's in, a, in an outfit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you said you're, so you're, you're, you're locked down in quarantine and, and you're putting this together. Um, how do you think the quarantine the pandemic and all the nutballs outside of your house uh, or running around, you know, whatever they're doing. Um, how do you think that affects you when you're trying to create? Well, with this one, it helped dictate or helped me decide which project to do because I start, you know, in the beginning days of the quarantine, I started thinking, well, what if, what if this is the last one? What if this is the only thing I get to do? And having a project to, cons to consume me was a great way of not really paying attention to all the news. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like going away on vacation when you're working on something. That's the, really the only thing you're thinking about. Um, it's also something that, you know, can get in the way. And this was a time when it wasn't going to get in the way because there wasn't anything else to do. Um, but yeah, my need to do something for my fellow man became, became a need at that moment when we're all locked away and hoping that things got better, but still not sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, I just wonder, uh, you know, it seems like some creative people, um, it really shuts some of them down. They're unable to really do or be motivated while others kind of escaped into the creative process, you know? Yeah, and I'm sure that's the same with, with all kinds of fields, that, you know, what, what draws you into the field, like art or mathematics or science, uh, is maybe not, you know, they're not all the same. You know, uh, I know that I personally kicked into high gear, and one of the reasons I did was because all of a sudden my partner was now working from home. Uh, my partner works from Old Town School of Folk Music, um, helping them to raise money. Uh, and all of a sudden, he's doing that in our kitchen. And I wanted him to see, when I'm working in my studio, this is what it looks like. You know, I, I, I got a chance during the quarantine to hear him in action and to really learn more about what he does for a living. That was really cool. And I'm sure that happened all across the country with the lockdowns. When people started working at home, you know, hopefully someone else around them hears them and thinks, wow. You are really good at what you do. You know, that's nice. It gave us a chance to see in, into each other's world 
and I wanted to be seen busy. Yeah. Well, I think it also created a lot of divorce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. God. Yeah. And some people with such tiny little apartments, yeah. you know, and they live alone or they mm. live in a tiny apartment with someone they they don't like and to be told, okay, now stay here for a year and a half. Yeah. That that's asking a lot. That's worse than van life. <laughs> yeah. <there's, laughs> At least with van life, you can drive somewhere else. Yeah, you can get yeah. out of your Change get your... out of your van, right? You can... Right. <laughs> Go in Seven Eleven and have a ball. I find you, you you're the most creative, like in your kitchen, your bedroom, downstairs, <laughs> outside, or or I, yeah, I didn't mean that in that way. But while you're at it, you can throw that in there. But or do you have a dungeon room or something like <laughs> like it, no? Is there do, I, what I'm what I'm trying to get at? Is there is there an actual assignment to your creativity like can you can you do like a lot of people where you okay i've got to do this i've got to you know clean the bathroom do this you have these list of things to do and all of a sudden from 11 to 3 i'm free so you schedule it off and i'm going to sit down and write or i'm going to sit down and draw yeah does that work i for you? have to do that i have to have a to-do list if i don't have a to-do list in my hand then I may feel like what I can really do is just kind of lay around and, and watch TV and get angry at the news. And I don't want that to happen. So I try to stay focused. When, when, when you're one man band, you, you know, nobody's going to tell you to get busy. If you want to, if you want to accomplish something, you got to get busy. If you really want to just lay on the couch, go ahead. But that, that gets you nowhere. Um, so I do try to keep myself motivated and I do try to, to plan out my times. Um, and like I said, I have a daily to do list and I'm really good at those. Um, especially like I, if I don't get to something and I put it on to the next day and then, and then I do that a third time, I notice it. And then I start questioning, maybe, maybe I'm not going to do this thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I try to keep myself motivated and, I like to think of projects that I'd like to do. You know, one thing I learned early on uh, making a living as an artist, no one was going to pay me to do the things I wanted to do. I had a, I had, no one was, no one was hiring. No one's looking for what I want to do. You know, I'm not going to find a job opening for, you know, finger puppet maker, sculptor. No, no one's looking for us. So I like to come up with projects and then go to places and pitch them. Um, and I've had some luck with that. Um, it's also, you know, for, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I was never associated with a college. I didn't go to art school. I don't have people in the industry helping me out. I'm a one man band. So, you know, if uh, like I knew that the Stuart Weitzman company hires artists to sculpt shoes for their windows, they do art shoes for their windows. So I sculpted a pair of shoes with nice little faces on the front, took a picture and sent them the picture. And I said, my, this is who I am. This is my work. This is what I would do for you. And they commissioned the first set of shoe windows that I did, which were like 12 pairs of shoes. And they all had little faces on them and they're really cute. And they did really well. And so over the years, I wound up making like four different lines of uh, windows for their uh, uh, shoes for their windows. Um, I did horror movie shoes. I did American history people shoes. I did all these different series. Um, and then my work wound up in Jane Weitzman's book, The Art of Soul. Um, there's no way that I could have gone after that, knowing what I was going after. All I knew is that I saw that they did, they, they did fun windows. They hired artists to do them. I wanted to play in their windows. And luckily, that led to a whole bunch of more work. Um, so, yeah, I've always kind of followed where my career took me uh, and tried to make good decisions along the way. Um, back when I was getting started, I was 25, and I introduced myself to the Disney studio. I sent a bunch of drawings in and got a really nice phone call back from Don Hahn, um, who told me that, you know, he really liked my look, that my drawings were very good, very warm, very accessible, but that I wasn't an animator, that I needed to learn animation for them to hire me. And so I thought about it for a while, about whether or not I would go to animation school to work at Disney. 
And then one day I was watching DuckTales and I just thought, I can't spend my life doing this. This can't be the fruits of my labor. It has to be more personal than this. And so I, I, I called them and said, thank you for your time. And then I'm, I'm going to go a different direction. Um, I, 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 when I was six, I was told that I have a malfunctioning aortic valve. And at that time, the thought was that someone with that could live to about 30. And they told me and my parents that when I was six and my parents. Uh, so ever since that time, I had it in my head that life was limited. And I never wanted to, I never wanted to waste it. I never wanted to feel like my life was being bought by, for a low wage. Um, and this book, you know, it, it's a just, it's a complete expression of self. This is what happened to me. And this is, this is what I want you to know that it happens to all of us. Well, what do you think of the, uh, our industry today? Do you think it's lost something because of the digital age? Um, no, I don't think it's lost anything. I think that's it's just another quiver in our bow. What's important is the storytelling. You know, some of these new cartoons are so beautiful, but you leave and you even forget what restaurant's selling the Happy Meal. You know, you forget you saw it. It's like it's just yeah, it was beautiful, but they're all kind of beautiful in the same kind of gem tone color way. Um, and you know, when you're watching. Uh, either a Netflix show or a Disney cartoon or anything. And you, as soon as you sit down, you know what the ending is going to be. Um, I find that, you know, it's 2021, you know, we're listening to new people. Now we're listening to new voices. And we have uh, some of these new shows that I see on cable, the, um, on net, I call everything a Netflix series. I, you know, they're all on the big things, <laughs> but they're, they're women voices telling women's stories from a women's a woman's point of view. These things are different. They're making jokes we never made before. And they have the freedom on cable or internet, whatever it is now. They have the freedom to do it. They're not pleasing a sponsor. They don't have to fit it into three minute segments in between, you know, commercial breaks. And it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. That's wonderful. Computer animation is a whole new thing. And it's leading us into computer imagery, which looks exactly like a real movie, but it's not. Mm. And the fact that they can take Marilyn Monroe's face and put it on Eddie Murphy's body, you know, does that make a good movie? I don't know. You know, it makes an interesting premise. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know where it's going to go. But like I said, I, th I just think of it as another quiver. And if it's a good story that, you know, that could be told with, with an Etch-A-Sketch. You know, it doesn't need anything more than that. So who are your biggest influencers? Um, Bill Henson, Jim Henson, um, uh, Bill Baird, some of the great puppeteers that I started loving when I was a child. Um, wonderful uh, artists and uh, cartoonists. One of them is Palmer Cox, who at the turn of the century drew the brownies who were little little uh, figures from all around the world. And the Brownie camera was uh, created after them. Um, I love him and his work and his story. Um, I hope Hollywood makes a story about him someday, a movie about him someday. He's got a great, great life. Uh, Picasso, Norman Rockwell, um, Van Gogh, Andy Warhol, all the all the greats, you know, all the all the people that devoted their life to it, all the people, you know, the, all the people that that took creativity seriously. Uh, Martha Graham, uh, another art hero of mine, well, she's got some wonderful quotes about the importance of creativity in a lifetime for people. Um, people like that, I, I, th I believe in that church, and I believe in it with my whole soul. Uh, that there's more to mankind and to life than we understand and know right now. You know, to say that we have to stop learning is just wrong. You can't. You really just can't. We're evolving whether we want to or not. We're not the same people we were 50 years ago. And evolution is a much bigger scale than that. 
So now, how how do people get a hold of you? Like, do you um, actually have a website, or do you have a place that you like people to come find you? Do you have a street address, phone number, uh, <laughs> app? Like, yeah, I've got well, my um, Dan Crowley Studio on Facebook and on Etsy. Um, both of those have message things where people can leave messages for me. Um, it's also a good place to see the other things that I do. One of the things you'll see on my, my Dan Crowley studio page on Facebook, um, there's a company in North Carolina called Spice Bouquet, and I do their online marketing, and that's cartoons. I do cartoons for them, on, uh, uh, and I post them and, and help them with their online sales. So you'll see a bunch of that stuff, too. Oh, that's interesting. We're going to have that linked up, of course, so people listening can find you. And we'll put your phone number and a few other things up there, too, for them. So, you know, so they can just call you direct. Um, I, you know, so what do you think people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, well, you know, it depends on who those people are. If they're the newsmen in, in Egypt, they would be... <laughs> It'd be full of surprises. Um, I'm a nice guy. I care about my fellow man. Um, I started off as a Catholic, and now I'm kind of a, on a wandering Episcopalian. Um, you know, I uh, I don't really join groups that well. I'm kind of a lone wolf. I always kind of have been. Um, I like watching humanity. I like watching mankind evolve. Um I like thinking big picture. Like I said, when I was, when I was young, I was told that I would die by the time I'm 30. So I've had this mindset of life is important and pay attention ever since. And it served me well. It really has. Um, I have a great memory and that's one of the reasons why I had so many stories to use for my book. Uh, and then stories, you know, that I threw out or I can't use. Uh, I remember everything. I really do have a very good memory. Um, and they're mostly good. They're mostly good. And the older I get, the more I can forgive the people who caused me trouble. Um, because I can see that I, I can, you know, I probably have been the age they were now. And I see where maybe they were having troubles of their own. Yeah, but, you know, when you look back, when you've, you've documented your early life in this book, um, and you look back at it, and you said that you chose the pictures and, and the writing part, there was a lot of emotion, mm -hmm. let's just say, anger and different feelings and stuff. But you look back at that whole time um, of you being young as, as a bad time or something, um, or, or is it something that really, if it didn't happen the way it did, you wouldn't be who you were? Well, exactly. Exactly. Everything that did happen, happened for its own reason and gave me some sort of strength or insight. You know, hurting gave me the insight to help other people who are hurting. Um, I know what it's like. Whatever, whatever life troubles, probably I've experienced it, you know, Um and being an artist and ha using my emotions and my feelings in my work to translate to other people, they're kind of close to the surface and maybe they're more accessible to me than other people who keep them further away. Um, you know, I cry a lot. I mean, I, I'm watching these TV shows and I'm an easy audience. I'll cry if they want the audience to cry. I really will. Um, <laughs> Uh, you have so, the Hallmark channel then, hey? Is that right, it? the Hallmark channel. <laughs> she found love, I'm so glad. And it's Christmas, so what do you know? <laughs> oh, boy. I always wondered who paid for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can see it, sitting there knitting and <laughs> you, you and the frog crying away, at, you know. Right, oh, right. It's a sad life, you know. But yeah, what, what I think they'd be a, you know, surprised that, you know, somebody was very nice, being nice to me, but somebody, uh, when they came to get their work from me, they had never met me before. And she's like, oh, my God, I didn't know you were so old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know you mean that as a compliment. Thank you. Get out of my house now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I didn't realize you're so old. I thought we were talking to a teenager today. Gee. <laughs> oh, wow. What's next? Where, do, where does what Mr. Is, Crowley go next? Well, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I've got this 
holiday season is pretty much booked with commissions for Christmas gifts other people are giving other people. Um, so that's nice. My sculpting work and commissions go well. Um, as far as the books go, I didn't know, like I said, that this book was going to be as successful as it is. I didn't know it was going to reach as many people as it is, has, and that I would hear from them. And I have. And I'm at the standpoint now where, like, do I go back to the projects I had on the burner or do I keep this somehow going with somehow doing something else with my earlier life? I don't really know yet. Hmm. We'll find out. Yeah, well, you know, and you, you do the finger puppets. Maybe you could. Maybe we could commission some cock puppets. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few chickens that I'd like to. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. I tell you, I'm I'm on the way to hell all the way. <laughs> Nasty, you okay? know a lot of people when you get there. Yeah, I can't even yeah. be. Part of it. How rude! How rude! Uh, well, it's certainly been fun talking to you, and it's a pleasure. And and um, I hope your book and everything does well. It certainly should. Um, so, um, and of course. Uh, the book we're talking about is Danny, Growing Up Gay and Creative, Growing Up Gay and Creative. It says that twice, just so you know. And, you. and our <laughs> guest is the author, Dan Crowley. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Alan David. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. Get the latest news and opinions from Eric Shapiro from the House of Mystery website in the Shapiro Report. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.